what a gift it is to worship you. Thank you so much for your word. It's the perfect user's manual on how we are to live our lives for you. May the truth of the Bible ever pierce our minds. Please help us as we commit ourselves to you without reservation, without doubts, without skepticism. Uh, you are true. Your word is true. You love us, and you will never let us down. Thank you for who you are. And for everyone who is listening, I ask that you will individually meet us where we're at, soften each of our hearts, and help us to be receptive to your teachings alone. Please teach us and uh, conform us to the image of your son. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, good morning. It's great to be able to be here today. I'm thankful that uh, for the opportunity to be able to come and bring the word to you this morning. Um, the, the last song we sang is such a appropriate intro into what this topic is we're talking about today in the book of Esther, about it, no matter what the lot that's cast, it, it's well with our soul. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Robert Lee. Uh, Sean and I, we work at the school. Uh, we've been gone a lot of this summer. In the summer, we go back and do some things with the family and help. And, and in the midst of that, almost I cut my leg off. I, uh, I, we were doing some chainsaw work and cleaning fence rows. So I'm thankful to be able to be here today. The, when you wear the pants to do the chainsawing, uh, it's, it's good when that takes the first hit and not your skin. It's uh, Royce. <laughs> When Royce found out about it, well, first of all, when I got back, he started calling me Stitches. But then, um, but then whenever, when he found out about it, he said, man, you're like literally taking the word of God, what it says, when it says if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, if you're, you know, what, what are, I gouge it out. And so, so I, you know, with friends like that, right? I mean, what <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, um, we got to do some fun things, and there were some events we got to be a part of this summer for um, one of our sons got engaged. There's some things we got to celebrate as far as uh, like an anniversary as well and um, for my, my wife and I. And, and in the midst of thinking about the, you know, the celebrations we got to be a part of and the fun things we got to do, there was some scripture I was reading in Esther and about a celebration that's an annual celebration of the Jews. And it still goes on to this today. It's the Feast of Purim. And it's a feast in which they celebrate the providence of God. And its origins are in the book of Esther. But, uh, but again, tying back into with the song about it, uh, you know, whatever lot is cast, it's well with my soul. This, uh, this is one of those deals where the, the people in this story between Esther and Mordecai, the Jewish people, they had a lot that was cast against them that was meant for bad, that was meant for evil. But, uh, but God, with his providence that will be unfolding today as we look at it, God in his providence protected his people. In fact, this was such an event that, was, that is significant to the Jews and has such a historical connotation that when the Nazis gained power, they suspended the celebration of it. They, uh, and, act, and to mark it, they would uh, hang people and murder people on the dates of the Feast of Purim. So we're going to learn about its significance and the characteristics of God's providence. Okay, so uh, just to give you, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a history buff, and so to give you, uh, I, I like to have a give, establish a good historical context. So part of my weakness when I read the Old Testament is that uh, for much of the time, things felt so abstract to me. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm knowing the Word of God to be true, but still trying to concrete it down to, to what, um, like to something that felt real, and in the sense of like where it fit in, the, in with historical events, where it fits within the Bible. Because, you know, we read our Bible, and it's not written in chronological order. So sometimes when you read things, you see things popping around. So, so I try, when I try to get to a text to understand it, to, uh, to give it some, uh, to kind of concrete it in like that. So we're going to be in the book of Esther. The, you know, it's right before, if you're going to flip to it in your, in your scripture, it's right before Job and the book of Psalms. But uh, what were the biblical events that led to the building into of this book? Well, up on the, the screen, you'll see, I mean, uh, the, you know, the kingdom of Israel had split. They had the ten northern tribes and the ten southern tribes. And so this one focuses on uh, as far as comes out of Judah, because Judah had been, um, the Babylonians over three invasions had, uh, had deported people then um, and to Babylon. And when Cyrus the Great, who was who's the Persian ruler, he had overthrown the Babylonians, and, and he began to, uh, un under the prompting 
of God, through providence, he began allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem to restore it and to rebuild it. That, um, and, that was, and, and, to, and also not only do that, but to begin re-entering back into worship of him at that location. And Cyrus the Great is the grandfather of the king that's in our story today. So where chronologically does all this fit in? You, so uh, Ezra and Nehemiah used to be one book, but, uh, but in time it was split. So the first six chapters of Ezra occur, and then we have the book of Esther, and then we have the, uh, the next uh, uh, chapters of Ezra followed by Nehemiah. So that's the, that's the order. So you have the, uh, Cyrus the Great allowed the first wave of people to go, the first wave of Jews to go back, chapters one through six of Ezra. Esther occurs, and then after Esther, and also Haggai and, um, and Zechariah were prophets during that time. But then after Esther, you have the second wave under Ezra that returns to Jerusalem to restore and rebuild, and then Nehemiah with a third wave follows. So uh, as far as the author of the book, it's unknown, but it's definitely somebody who was familiar with Persian, uh, the Persian court and Jewish traditions. Now, what, uh, so what is occurring in society at this time? Again, the Persians have world power. And, and one reason I'm showing you this, because I, I really want you to get a feel of how massive the Persians were and how God behind the scenes his providence was executed. And his name's not even ever mentioned in this book. It's one of two books in the Bible, the name of God is never spoken. And, uh, but yet his providence is critical here. The, the whole coral area, you see, that's the Persian Empire. It, it's roughly the, the size of what we, as our United States. And it was made up of 127 provinces like, uh, that are like states. It went from, uh, from India all the way over to Egypt and uh, that the tip of Asia, and then uh, parts of, uh, tried to get parts of Greece. They had a postal system like us, a taxation system. So, but specifically, where, where we're looking at in the empire, where it unfolds, is right there in Susa, Susa the citadel. There, uh, this is a, so purportedly where uh, David's buried, but you know, uh, Daniel is buried. But, uh, you know, because Daniel was deported with the Babylon, uh, under Babylonian rule, and he was part of the Babylonian and the Persian Empire. So Susa is, is one of the winter capitals for the, uh, for the Persians. And I want to give you a little bit of a picture of, of the king in this story. So who's the ruler? But more importantly, after I want you to give a little bit of a picture of who this ruler is and what makes him up. So his name, in, in, uh, as far as in Persia, uh, in Persian, would be Hasharasha. In Hebrew, as we see in the scripture, Ahasuerus. But in English, Xerxes. So you, that movie 300. I mean, you, you hear of Xerxes and the Persians. He was uh, a, a ruthless kind of fellow. He was a smart person. He used his persuasion very well. When, uh, after his father was, uh, was Darius I, and when it came time for the, the next in line to be appointed king, actually uh, Ahasuerus, or, or Xerxes, was not the next in line. He had an older brother, but he made the argument, to the, he made the argument that since uh, his older brother wasn't born while the f their father was king, and since, uh, uh, since Ahasuerus' mother was the uh, daughter of Cyrus the Great, that he was the pure blood through timing, and through who he is born through. And therefore, with his use of persuasion, he, uh, he uh, asup, usurped that, and although not the firstborn, became the king. Another thing is I want you to see his temper. He had a large army, and uh, Herodotus, the historian, said that, that when the mass of the Persians would move through an area, that, and, and uh, they would stop and let their horses feed in the river, it would dry it up. So it was, it was like a horde of people that would move through. He, uh, an example of this that I'm going to highlight his temper is that in a military campaign that he had, he had 250,000 uh, 250, soldiers, and he was positioned in Turkey. So at that tip of Asia, he needed to cross to get over into Greece. His father had had issues with Greece, and he couldn't, uh, couldn't overthrow them. And, uh, and so Ahasuerus had backed up, had to take care of some things in Egypt, or so some uprisings in there, and now he was circling back around to, to take care of the Greeks. 
and to try to overthrow them. Well, so what he had to cross the Helen spot, and that's, a, that's about a mile across. There is no bridge. There's no natural place to cross. Well, he had his uh, engineers build uh, a, build a bridge. Well, the, the bad weather came, destroyed the bridge. He was so furious at his engineers, he beheaded all of them. And he, uh, he was angry with the water, so he had, uh, he had uh, some of his, uh, like his warrior soldiers get hot spears with a re- a red hot irons and stab the waves of the water. He threw shackles into the water to try to enslave it. He, um, and, uh, and then he also gave it, like in the picture up here, gave it th- had the men give it 300 lashes. So he, he was a person of, if something didn't go the way he intended, then uh, there was a temper that was boiling immediately under the skin. But also, a third thing about him, he was headstrong. Just because this happened, because he couldn't cross the Helen spot, he, uh, he got a new batch of engineers, and these were a little more careful, and they, they got 600 ships, and, and made, you can think of it like a two-lane road across the Helen spot. They turned them uh, sideways, and they anchored them heavy on each end, and they, did, they, they situated them with the flow of the current, and they actually built bridges abo- a, a, above on top of them. They built up on the sides so that the horses and all the animals going across and pulling the people through wouldn't be spooked by the water. They put the dirt and earth over them, and they were very, he was uh, expected a high, um, he expected this to work. So this was a headstrong, his people responded, um, and, and that's when they came, then they crossed the Helen spot, defeated Greece, uh, uh, they defeated in Athens, but they couldn't defeat Greece. You know, heard the story, again, of the 300 Spartans being apart. There were some key battles that happened. It pushed, uh, pushed Ahasuerus back. But, um, and this is, wh- and, and so he, he began to leave because the, some of the victories they had, he was getting worried. Some of the victories that the, the Greeks were having, he was getting worried they might burn his pontoon bridge. And then how could he get back to his kingdom at that point with all of his rule and all of his authority and, and where all of his strength is? So he went ahead and left and left the general in charge, but he went back home um, dejected and uh, defeated. And this is where Esther 2 begins. So, so you have the picture. Esther 1, he uh, uh, occurred, and he went over there and had these, uh, between Esther 1 and Esther 2, it's when all these battles occurred. So we've established the historical context. Now, the best part is we get to study the scripture. We're going to learn the significance of the Feast of Purim, and we're going to see the characteristics of God's providence. So as we move into this, I want you to consider what the Apostle Paul wrote. That's a a good basic scripture about providence. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose not all things i mean all things not some but all things work together for those of us who are his i was listening to a conference and a speaker defined providence his name is phil Phil johnson that providence is god's continuous involvement with his creation whereby he preserves and governs all his creations from the greatest to the least so that in accord with his perfect will and design, he sovereignly orders everything he's made to accomplish everything he intends intends for his own glory. So so providence has nothing to do with us other than we're the object of what, other than we're God's object to accomplish his will and achieve his glory. So we want to be in a place when we're reading, when we're looking at Esther today, I want to, to to speak on it from the perspective of we're celebrating God's providence and what we get to join him in. Not what he does for us, not, uh, not about our wants, but about his will, about us being aligned to him and not to us for his glory, not ours. So from today's teaching, we're going to learn characteristics of God's providence that includes three things. The first is protection through his promises. The second is God's presence that is sovereign. And again, his name is never mentioned in this book, but his sovereignty is stamped everywhere throughout it. And then third, we'll learn about how he positions his people. So as we work through uh, Esther, we're going to see how God's orchestration of events with sovereign precision exercises his glory and brings glory to him. And then 
the people, then, then how the Jewish people concluded that by celebrating him in the Feast of Purim. So let's go to the book of Esther. Turn there. If you go digitally, then look it up. We'll start in Esther 1. Now we're going to, I'm going to pick out key verses throughout Esther. So uh, I'm going to sporadically be jumping, but it will be in order. So just be ready to, to flip, flip the pages. So Esther 1, verse 1. Now it happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was at the citadel in Susa. So we, we, were, we covered that about, uh, about him, uh, about um, being over the 127 provinces, the size. Uh, I mean, 50 million people lived in the, the borders of Persia. It's a hu- it was a huge empire at that time. Half, at that time, half the world's population lived within uh, the Persian Empire. Oops. So in, um, in the third year of his reign, he held a feast for all his princes and servants. The military officers of Persia and Medea, um, the nobles and princes of his provinces being in his presence, while he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. So this is the part where it's the, this thought to be the military planning campaign of six months. And uh, now we'll pick back up in verse 5. And when these days were completed, as far as this military campaign uh, planning, the king gave uh, for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And in the king's palace, you would have an inner court, a middle court, an outer court. You would have the king's quarters, the king's throne. Uh, there would be a banquet area. There would be, uh, uh, they were, uh, he was known to have this nice palace garden. And all of these, in some capacity, will come to fruition and be talked about within this story. But he, um, and drinks were served in gold vessels of various kind, and the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's hand, which would be his uh, royal generosity. So there was no shortage of, uh, of alcohol that was flowing there. And when Mary with wine, in verse 11, the king commanded that Queen Vashti, uh, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal uh, crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful in appearance. Now, for whatever reason, Queen Vashti refused. So she refused this king, who she knew the temperament of him. She declined for whatever reason. Was it because, I mean, there were two different banquets that are occurring. There was the banquet that, uh, for the military campaign that, you know, that he had had with his princes in, on one hand, and then also within the royal palace, there was another banquet that Queen Vashti was hosting. Well, for whatever reason, in, in the, the merriment, when he was married with wine, he made this request that his beautiful wife in all of her adornment of the royal adornment be brought before his banquet. Well, probably for good reason she refused, but that enraged him. And we're going to see that his, his temper, that with his temper, he wants absolute obedience. So he sought the counsel of his wise men. In verse 15, we pick back up. According to the law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti? Because she did not do the declaration of King Ahasuerus. Then in the presence of the king and the princes, Mamukan said, Queen Vashti has committed iniquity against not only the king, but also against all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. So there was a concern the princes had, is that Queen Vashti, the leader of this other banquet, would begin setting a tone. Uh, I guess you could think of like a women's liberation movement, right? I mean, that wasn't an ideal time for women during this time period in any capacity. And, and Queen Vashti took a stance, and the princes and the wise men were concerned that other women in the kingdom would, there'd be an uprising, and they would look at their husbands with uh, indignation. So what they said, uh, so in verse 19, if it seems good to the king, this was their advice, let a royal word go forth from him and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media so that it cannot be repealed that Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus and they'd already even removed her name by then and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she so now we see with this king that insubordination has an immediate penalty she couldn't even come into his presence any longer 
He liked control, and he had no tolerance for anything outside of that, even for those that were closest to him. Let's pick back up in Esther 2. Now, Esther 2, remember, when this picks back up, that's when the military campaign's completed. He's come back home defeated and frustrated that he uh, wasn't able to conquer Greece. Uh, Verse 1, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decided against her. So it was recommended to him that they find a new queen, one that was beautiful. They were going to find this this lovely virgin that would uh, live somewhere in the Persian Empire. So if there were 50 million people, there would be millions of women. And um, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, said that of the millions of women, it was narrowed down to 400. And this is where we see Esther is one of the 400 who was chosen. And Esther lived in Susa, the citadel. And, and whoever Esther was with, she gained their favor. She had grown up under Mordecai, and she uh, was obedient to him, and she followed his instructions very strictly. And one of his instructions to her, although we're not told why, is he warned her, do not reveal your heritage, do not reveal that you are a Jew. And, and that is part of God's provision that we'll see as this story unfolds, the necessity of that. Verse 17, um, And the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she advanced in favor and loving kindness before him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen in place of Vashti. Verse 21, we see that Mordecai gets in a place that he has an opportunity to save the king. Now, Mordecai is at the king's gate, and he overhears some, door, uh, some two doorkeepers that uh, are plotting an assassination on King Ahasuerus. So for whatever reason, it says that the doorkeepers were furious and sought to send forth their hand against King Ahasuerus. Now, Esther was already queen at this time, and Mordecai and Esther had communication because of Mordecai's position Somehow he was positioned within the palace. It doesn't say where, but he had access at the king's gate. And um, so he relayed the message to Queen Esther. Queen Esther then relayed it, and, uh, and they searched it out. They found it to he, she relayed it to King Ahasuerus, and, the, and they searched it out, found it to be true. This was what was going to happen, and both of these men were hanged. Now, a providential piece of this is that this was written in the Chronicles of the King. Although Mordecai wasn't rewarded at the time, his act of saving the king was recorded in the Chronicles. And now enters the devious and evil Haman. He is second only to the king in throughout all of Persia. He had advanced with among the princes, and he was the highest official, second only to Ahasuerus. Interestingly enough, Scripture tells us that he was an Agagite. And, uh, and um, but being this high official, the king had orders that when he would, uh, that when uh, Haman would go through the city gates or the, the king's gates, that the, uh, the servants would have to bow down to him. Not only bow, but prostrate themselves down before him. And, uh, but, uh, but interesting enough, Mordecai would not do it. And Mordecai's justification to the peers that he worked with was, I'm a Jew. So since I'm a Jew, I will not bow down to this man. Well, this uh, infuriated um, Haman, and he made a decision that he was going to destroy not only Mordecai, but the people of Mordecai to be the Jews. So, there, but so why would there be such, uh, such a strain there? I mean, y- you think if it's just one person, well, then take the one person out. But, um, but, but why would there be such an intensity towards the two people of Haman hating Mordecai and Mordecai not wanting to do this for, uh, or Mor- Mordecai feeling this way back towards uh, Haman. Well, there's three possibilities. One, Haman could have had a grudge over a birthright all the way back from Isaac because you had, uh, remember, uh, Esau and Jacob. Were, you had Esau and Jacob, twins. Esau was born first, Jacob second. And all these the blessings uh, Jacob, although he was the second born, got the, got the uh, birthright of the firstborn. So uh, Haman was a descendant, being an Ag- uh, Agagite, he was a descendant of King Agog, 
who was the, over the Amalekites, who were named after Prince Amalek, who was the grandson of Esau. All right, so, so there's a lineage there. And uh, so th that could be, it's like, well, I want this person who stole my birthright uh, hundreds of years ago to bow before me and prostrate himself because look who's in charge now. So that, that's one possibility. Another is that maybe Mordecai had a grudge against him because it was the uh, Prince Amalek and the Amalekites that in the Exodus, when, they were, when the Jews were leaving uh, Israel, I mean, were leaving Egypt, that in the Exodus, it was the Amalekites that ta attacked them from the rear where the, the weak, the elderly, the stragglers were of the great Exodus. They attacked that part of the Jewish people. And, uh, and God had promised to blot out the memory of Amalekite because of his anger over this. And he told Moses, uh, Moses, you must n not forget. And even Moses' first battle was with Amalek also when he had to hold the, the, the rod up. And as long as the rod was held up, they were winning. If the hands came down, then the Amalekites began to win. Um, so, I mean, possibly Mordecai had a grudge. Then a third could be a tribal feud, which kind of fits in line with the other. You think of it this way, uh, being an Agagite, Mordecai being an Agagite, was a direct descendant of King Agog. King Agog was killed during King Saul's reign. King Saul was a Benjamite, Mordecai's a Benjamite. Your tribe was part of what took, you know, killed one of my, uh, 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 the person who I'm a descendant of. But the reality is those are just, it doesn't matter what they were or if it was something else. The reality is, is we know this, that we know that Haman hated Mordecai and the Jews, and he was going, he was going to take this matter to Ahasuerus. So in Esther 3, verse 8, then, then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all the other people, and they do not do the king's laws, so it is not worth it for the king to let them remain. So Haman was able to present his plan to the king. And, and just like we heard in the song about no matter what lot is cast, it's well with our soul. Well, what Haman did, he cast lots. He, uh, he cast per, P-U-R, and that's, to, that's casting lots to determine a date that he wanted to execute this plan of genocide against the Jews. And then once that date was set by casting uh, through per, which is casting lots, then that's when he went before King Ahasuerus, and he got the king agreed to, the, to, to agree to the uh, plan. And this is what, uh, in verse 9, and letters were sent by the hand of couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to accuse all the Jews to perish, both young and old, little ones and women, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is, is in the month of Adar, and to plunder their spoil. A copy of that which was written down to be given as law in every province was revealed to all the peoples so, they sh so that they should be ready for this day. So there was some careful planning that occurred. And now uh, it, uh, Haman's issue with Mordecai and the Jewish people, he, in his mind, he had an end date. He knew that that person that would not bow to him at the king's gate and the people that represented him, uh, the, the, the Jewish people would be eradicated. So within this context, you have Mordecai, obviously, it w he's within Susa, the citadel. He's just, he, the sa he begins to mourn, has a sackcloth and ashes. Um, he's, he's, uh, you know, he tears his clothes. And because of his proximity, uh, Esther realizes something's going on with him. So she sends one of her eunuchs who cares for her to, to inquire, well, what is it that's happening? Why, why the mourning? Why... Uh, why are you tearing your clothes? So Mordecai explained what was occurring. He uh, even gave a copy of the decree to the eunuch, and he commanded Esther to plea for the, for the saving of the Jews. And this was not a small request. Now she had, according to some of the scriptures, she had been obedient to him under his leadership as she, uh, uh, he was 15 years older than her, raised her as his own, as, as his own child, and she was obedient to him, to his instructions, and now he's commanding her to plea for the Jews. And we'll see her struggle with this. Let's pick up Esther 4, chapter 4, verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathok and commanded him to reply to Mordecai. 
all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king, to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, and that he be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter so that he may live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for these 30 days. So they told Esther's words to Mordecai. Then Mordecai said for them to respond to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's house can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not reached royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther said for them to respond to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women also will fast in the same way. And this I will go in, into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded. So we see here, I mean, Esther, reasonably so, and so I'm glad skip, scripture captures it, is that there's, there's the nervousness, there's the anxiety, there's the not knowing, well, if I go before the king and he doesn't extend the golden scepter, then I'm dead. She knows that is the risk for her. Um, but she, um, so we pick back up and, um, that on the third day of the fast, the king was sitting in his royal throne. You'll see the, the royal throne, you have it labeled there. And she went to the inner court. She had her royal robes on and went to the inner court. And, a, uh, and the king saw her there. And having favor towards her, he extended the scepter to her. And, and when he extended it to her, he said, What is it you wish for, my queen? You may have up to half the kingdom. So she walked in and uh, touched the end of the scepter and then presented her request. And her request was simple. She just wanted to be able to invite the king and Haman to a feast that she had prepared. So this is the first banquet. They had the banquet, and for whatever reason, it was just the three of them there, King Ahasuerus, Haman, and Esther. For whatever reason, the timing wasn't right. So when the king said, well, why have you summoned us here at this feast? And well, what is your request? I'll give you up to half the kingdom. And she said, well, if it would please you, then I would like to serve, have you come to another banquet tomorrow night, and I will make my request known at that time. So, uh, so it ended. That, that was over. And we pick up Esther 5, verse 9. Then Haman went out that day glad and merry of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with wrath against Mordecai. I mean, there was no way to please uh, Haman. Either uh, whatever would happen, Mordecai was not showing the respect that Haman thought he was due, whether someone would stand as he walked by or they would fall down before them and bow. It didn't matter. He just had hate for him. Um, then Haman, at that point, went home to his family and began to recount to his family, oh, look at the glory of my riches. Look at all that I've attained. Look at the ten sons that I have. Look at how I have, uh, have worked my way up and I am second only to the king. And, and now, not only have I gone to one banquet, with the king and queen, but I have favor with both of them, and now I'm going to another banquet tomorrow night. And then in verse 13, yet all of this is worth nothing to me every time I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. I mean, deception can be very strong to, to, for what people blind them to what they see. So his family encouraged him to make, the, to make gallows the next day and use those gallows to hang Mordecai on. And this would be uh, he would do this the next day. Now, at the same time, while all of this is occurring, and he's, and he's been talking to his family, you know, then Haman goes to sleep, has a, probably a peaceful night of rest, looking forward to everything that he's wanted coming to fruition. But at the same time, in verse 6, chapter 1, this is happening. During that night, sleep had fled from the king. So he said for them to bring the book of memoranda, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Well, through God's providence, what was read to the king was how the assassination plot had been blocked by Mordecai. Well, the king's response was, well, what have we done to celebrate this man? I don't see that recorded. 
And, well, and the eunuch said, well, nothing had been recorded. You haven't rewarded him. Now, day two, the king had uh, gotten his sleep. And, um, and Haman is going to the palace now. He's, he's entering the outer courts. He goes to the palace. He's getting excited because he's going to make his request to, uh, the, to use the gallows that are being constructed at this very moment while he's going. And after, uh, Esther 6, verse 6, so, ca- so Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said in his heart, Whom would the c- king delight to honor more than me? So he began to list off the things that, the king sh- that he would want to have done for him. Well, get out a, a royal robe that you've worn. Pull out one of your royal horses that you've ridden and, and sit this person on it. Put the robe on them. Put them on the horse. Uh, put, one, put your crown upon the person's head and have one of your most noble officials take this person through the, the streets of Susa and announce this is what the king does for one within whom he delights. In verse 10, Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you have spoken. So Haman did it. He had no choice. He hurried home. After he did it, then out of mourning and frustration, he immediately went back to his house, and he began to recount to his family this horrendous event of what he had to do. And while he was telling his family, the eunuchs arrived to get him at his home to now take him to the second banquet. And at this, uh, at the second banquet, they began to drink their wine. And, um, and it, it, at banquets and feasts, uh, when Persian rulers would get together with, uh, with the princes, it wasn't uncommon if they, had some, if they had matters to, historically speaking, if they had matters to settle, that they would uh, drink... Uh, to the point where their hearts were merry with wine, and then the next day, then uh, th- they would decide a matter, and then the next day they would get together and come to a conclusion on the matter. So, uh, so again, here they are drinking wine at the feast, and the queen and, and the king inquired of Esther, "What is your request? I'll give you up to half the kingdom." And she made a specific plea to, that the life of her and the life of her people be spared, that they would not be killed. In Esther 7, verse 5, this was the response. Then King Ahasuerus said, he said to Esther the queen, Who is the one, and where is this one, who fills his heart to do this? So Esther said, An adversary and an enemy is this evil Haman. Then Haman became, became terrified before the king and queen. I mean, it's just the three of them that are the guests at this, that, uh, are at this feast. And the, the proximity of it, the pointing, at the, the, the naming him of what he has decided to do in, uh, against not only Esther, but against the Jews. And the king, it says, in wrath, arose, stopped drinking his wine, arose from the banquet area, and went out and, and stormed out into the palace garden. And Haman, realizing what was, how the king was feeling towards him, uh, went to Esther, who was on the couch, and threw himself down and began to plead for his life because he thought, well, this is my best way to save myself. And at that point, the king returned in, saw Haman outstretched, pleading for his life, holding on to the queen, and he said, what? Will you assault the queen in my house with me present? And as those words came out of his mouth, they cover, uh, the eunuchs that were there covered Haman's face and uh, and one of the eunuchs said, well, he built some gallows to hang Mordecai on. And, he, uh, and so the king said, well, then go and take him and do likewise. And then it said the king's uh, anger subsided. But you think about that, how the tables quickly turned just within that moment. But God's providence was always at work the entire time. And so although the king was aware of this problem, but it was a law. And and the the problem with this well the problem with it is that the king's law, this evil scheme that Haman put into effect, couldn't be stopped. So the king reminded them in Esther eight, verse eight, 
he reminded them that a written decree, which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring, may not be turned back. But he did allow Mordecai to write a letter with whatever content he chose. And Mordecai chose to, uh, to put a new law in that allowed the Jews to assemble and defend themselves throughout the entire kingdom. And so this letter was sealed with the king's signet ring. Uh, Mordecai was actually given the ring, so that he, and he was put into a place of power. That, uh, and he actually became, took Haman's place in that regard. And this letter was sent throughout the kingdom. Then the day arrived for the evil scheme to, uh, to be put into place. Remember, the, the date that was set through Pur, the casting of lots. The Jews uh, at, on this day had the power, because uh, those there's people who wanted to overthrow the Jews because they hated them, but the Jews were able to assemble, and no one could stand against them. Victory belonged to them on that day. In, Ve- in Esther 9, verse 5, Thus the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and causing them to perish. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. They killed them, but they took no plunder from the people. So there's no record of any of the Jews dying. Now in Susa, uh, the citadel, there was record that 500 Jews, uh, I mean that, that, that the Jews had killed 500 people that hated them. And, 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 t- and Haman's 10 sons were hanged. And even Esther had made a request that they be put up on the gallows for the people to see. Now, um, but as far as the remainder of the providences, it recorded 75,000 people who were killed that hated the Jews. So providence was present in the midst of this. So there's characteristics when we look at this. There are characteristics that we can look for in our lives. First of all, the protection through promises. I mean, why the necessity of protecting the Jews from genocide? Well, God did not want to jeopardize the Abrahamic or Davidic covenants. Those covenants were critical for us to have, for us here in this room, those of us who are believers in Christ, to step into another set of promises about a coming Messiah and to be uh, in all the works that he provided us. I mean, Paul laid it out, uh, all the works of Christ in Ephesians 1, and he wrote to the church. He said that we're chosen, we're adopted, we're redeemed, we're enlightened because we get to understand the mystery of God's will, and we're sealed. We're sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. This is all in, in Ephesians 1. These are the promises that we step into, and this is the protection that we as believers have. So, in this, so, so we get to celebrate rest also. In the same way that there is the Feast of Purim, and the Jews... Uh, were delivered from Haman's evil scheme and they got to rest in that we have the resurrection as Christians and that resurrection saves us from eternal death the schemes of Satan both are providentially protected through God's promises and the second characteristics we see of God's uh, providence is his sovereign presence although never mentioned in Esther He divinely orchestrated events for years to cause everything to fall into place at his timing so that his will could be exercised. And where where do we see God's providence? Uh, uh, We see it with Esther because she was orphaned and raised by Mordecai. Vashti was deposed. And and then then Esther became queen from the millions to the 400 to the one. And she didn't review her Jewish heritage. Those are all providence. Uh, How do we see it with Mordecai? He overheard the assassination plot in the right place at the right time. God had him there. Uh, But then he wasn't rewarded for it, but it was was recorded in the Chronicles. So then he did get that that reward. Um, And then he rose to power, and he was able to write the letter to create a new law to protect the Jewish people. And how do we see God's providence through King Ahasuerus? Well, he was unable to sleep that night. He was restless. And how many chronicles does he have? And the Persians were known for their ability to keep records. But, uh, but the eunuchs read that set of chronicles. And even through Haman, God used the evil of Haman. Amen, uh, because he had a disdain for the Jews, the timing of his evil scheme, and the making of the gallows for him to hang on. All of these things, God used both evil and good 
for his own will. Like Romans 8.28, we read in the beginning, for all things work together towards good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. All things. So even though um, the, you didn't, there weren't miracles of God seen in the capacity like you saw when there was uh, uh, the exodus with the, uh, or, or like we see in the New Testament with the healings that occurred, um, we do know that, that, uh, that God's presence was there and he was at work. Because you think about Genesis, uh, uh, in Genesis 50, 20, think about Joseph. Remember when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers? And then his brothers uh, came before him, and he was trying to console them and tell them, look, I mean, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to do what has happened on this day to keep many people alive, to keep the Jewish people strong and fervent, to keep the lineages going. So, so we can celebrate God's sovereign presence, whether, it's be, whether we can see his presence at that time or not. And the third characteristic is position. Uh, he positions his people for his glory, not for our pursuits, not, for our, not to supply our selfish demands, but it's for his glory. We, uh, our responsibility is to, uh, is to practice obedience wherever we're placed, like Esther and Mordecai. Look at the circumstances they were in, bleak circumstances, but they practiced, they were diligent in, uh, in, in obedience, and with their diligence, they were used to exercise God's will. And what they did was important because not only is this positioning of them within that time, but it was positioning for something else, because remember the placement of where the book of Esther falls. Esther falls right after the first wave of the people have been allowed to go back to Jerusalem to begin restoring Jerusalem, the wall, the temple. Now the book of Esther occurs. These events occur of God positioning his people. Because why? Because God wants to restore worship in Jerusalem. He, wants, he wanted to rebuild it and restore the temple, build it. He wanted to restore worship of him for his people to enter into worship of him. And also, we... Uh, as far as what positioning as people, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah came out of this, but Ezra historically was part of the great council. It was 120 leaders. He was the leader of the leaders, and he sat on this council, and they were part of what canonized the Old Testament and protected it. So no matter the circumstance, we should all be in a place as Christians, as believers, of celebrating being positioned that, w- that we can exalt and worship God. So to wrap it up, Esther 9, verse 20. Then Mordecai wrote down these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both near and far, to establish among them to celebrate the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the same month annually, because on those days the Jews obtained rest for themselves from their enemies, and it was a month which was turned around for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness and sending portions of food to one another and gifts to the poor. I put this picture of a cube up there. That's, that's, it wasn't uncommon for lots to be cast that way, um, and then they would read them back in that time. So for, in verse 24, for Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to cause them to perish and had cast pur, that is the lot, to throw them into confusion and cause them to perish. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the name Pur. And thankfully, we serve a God who has promises that are eternal. We, we aren't in a place of serving man where, well, let's just hope this happens and the dice are rolled. And we serve a God of providence, of sovereign providence. One that we should be in a place of being reminded to celebrate his providence in our lives. Although we may not celebrate the Feast of Purim formally, but we should exalt God in our worship all the time because of what he's done. So I'll close asking you these questions. How has God's providence been evident in your life? I mean, do you rest in his protection? Do you rest in his promises? Do you experience his presence in your life? And are you positioned to glorify him in your daily walk? How do you celebrate him? 
Do you know him and rest in his protection and his presence and his positioning for you? Christ was very specific, and uh, Christ is specific and said in Scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And after the service, I'll be available to, to talk with anyone or if anybody wants to pray. Uh, but at this time, we'll, we'll close. In, uh, well, we're going to have a prayer, and then the Zach and the music team will come back up, but we'll close this part of the, for the teaching. Father, thank you for the immensity of your love for us. God, thank you for your providence. Thank you that you allow us to, to, be, a part of, um, to be a part of your will, that we get to join you, that we get to align with you, that, and that we are your possession. May we exalt you and praise you, and may we find ourselves celebrating what you've done and that we get to be a part of it. In your son's name we pray. Amen.